Uh, Cabbie Theology is a place uh, where we invite a theologian to come in uh, to bring an idea that somehow intersects with what's going on in the contemporary world. And you don't get more contemporary, really, than this topic. Uh, when I spoke to Philip earlier, he said when he suggested this a couple of years ago, he thought it would be just a passing thing. <laughs> I hope your judgment is not out on other matters <laughs> in such a way. Uh, so I'm delighted to have uh, uh, Philip here, um, uh, Philip Hobday, who's the vicar at Early St. Peter's. In a former life, he was a chaplain at Magdalen uh, College in Cambridge. Uh, he's now vicar uh, with his wife, Hannah. Uh, he's currently coming to the end, I think, of a PhD uh, on Richard <laughs> Hooker, uh, who's an Elizabethan uh, theologian of the Reformation period. Uh, so. Uh, we have invited him to speak about God, the British, and Europe. So let's welcome Philip. Can you all hear all right? Is that okay? Great. Well, um, as the late, great Kenneth Williams said, what a pleasure it is for you to have me. Uh, uh, but um, it's wonderful to be here. Thank you for asking me, and uh, I hope um, that you will find something of interest uh, in what I might say. I want to uh, start with a great theologian. Um, I don't know if any of you recognise that rather bad picture of Treebeard, the Ent from Tolkien's Lord of the Rings. Uh, when the young hobbits meet Treebeard, the first question they ask him is, whose side are you on? And I can't help thinking that that might be the first question <laughs> in your minds as well. Whose side am I on? Uh, which way did I vote? What do I think about Brexit? Uh, and if I answer any of your questions this evening, let me begin by saying that that's one I'm not going to answer. Uh, because I realise that although full disclosure is all the rage these days uh, from speakers, if I were to tell you how I voted, uh, and you are at all representative of the wider country, uh, I would offend 48 or possibly 52 percent of you. So I've opted for the much safer tree beard course, and I hope that in the course of this evening's talk, not only will you have no idea about my personal views, but also that I will say something which offends everybody in the room. Uh, the more serious reason why uh, I don't want to tell you which way I went in that great recent uh, debate is that I think there were some good arguments for leaving and some good arguments for remaining and some shockingly bad arguments on both sides. And I hope that we will see some of what I think are the bad arguments uh, in the first part of our time together. The second reason uh, I don't think it's very helpful for me to say uh, what I think is because as a theologian, it's part of my job to try and tease out what God might think about it. It's not immediately clear to me uh, that Christianity requires one or other kind of answer to the question of what our relations with the European Union should be. So to take a random example, the Bible does have a lot to say about trade. It's very concerned in its profits uh, with weights and measures being accurate, and it's worried because the people who suffer if traders cheat their customers are the poor and the most vulnerable. But if you opened the profits and tried to find some help with details of tariffs or regulatory alignment or non-tariff barriers to trade, the profits would not give you very much by way of help. Treebeard, when he's asked which side are you on, says, I'm not on anybody's side because no one is altogether on my side. That's often the way I feel about Brexit, and I have a sneaking suspicion that that might be what God thinks about it as well. So I don't think uh, you can say that Christianity requires one view uh, about Brexit, or indeed about quite a lot of contentious political issues, and so we're going to try and do something a bit different. I want to try and say that by looking in more detail at one episode in Britain's Christian history, the break with Rome in the 16th and 17th centuries, we might be able to learn some lessons that will help us, whether we're a lever or a remainer or just a sick of the whole thing. But there are some things we didn't quite get right during the uh, referendum debate or afterwards 
that we need to get right if we're going to find a good way forward as a country as we navigate our new relationship with the European Union. So I'm going to, after some introductory remarks, try and tell you what I think at Leave got wrong. I'm going to try and tell you what I think Remain got wrong. And if I haven't offended all of you by that point, I'm going to try and tell you what I think the European Union got wrong. Having offended everybody in the room in one way or another uh, in the last few minutes of our time together, I want to try and draw out some constructive lessons at uh, some things that I think really would help us as a society as we find the way ahead. So we're going to start um, with a text. The words of Acts of Parliament, if you've ever had cause to read an Act of Parliament, don't normally get the heart racing. They're not generally very memorable. They don't usually have a hold in the wider culture. The only exception I could think of um, is the phrase from the Children Act that the welfare of the child is paramount, uh, which many of us will know from our professional lives and has now been the basis of uh, a brilliant book uh, by Ian McEwan and a film uh, with uh, Emma Thompson. But apart from that, it's very difficult to think of words in an Act of Parliament which might really get you going. And when I tell you that we're going to start in 1533 with the Act in Restraint of Appeals, uh, you might wonder what on earth that is about. At least the Children Act tells you what it's going to do on the tin. But in the Act in Restraint of Appeals, which was the first piece of Reformation legislation in England, we read this. This realm of England is an empire, and hath been so accepted in the world, governed by one supreme head and king, and so on it goes, to keep it from the annoyance as well of the Sea of Rome as from the authority of other foreign potentates attempting the diminution or violation thereof. If, as I did a couple of weeks ago, you Google this realm of England is an empire, you won't find top of your search list at the text of the Act, you won't find a learned scholarly article, and you won't find some GCSE bite-sized history revision. It will take you to a link to a blog post written by then Mr. John Redwood. So let's start there. Mr. Redwood offers a fairly simple kind of parallel based on this phrase, this realm of England is an empire. And uh, in a fairly simple and we might say simplistic sort of way, uh, Sir John, as he now is, says that we ought to leave the European Union because we've done something similar once before. In the 16th century, he argues, uh, England on the edge of the European continent broke away from an overbearing, tyrannical, unresponsive, supranational institution which cared little about the distinctive circumstances of each nation state. And England charted its own course as a brave and plucky nation alone of itself. That almost sounds like a caricature, but in fact it's not. If you uh, go on, you'll find several speeches in Hansard and other places, in which quite a lot of people on the Leave side say, we ought to leave the EU now because we left its predecessor, the medieval Catholic Church, before. Now, as I said, I think there are good arguments for leaving the European Union, just as I think there are good arguments for remaining. Whatever else it is, the Redwood kind of argument in this case is not a good one, as I shall now try and demonstrate. But do bear in mind, I think Remain got things wrong as well. If we think about the Reformation, uh, this is who, of course, we think of straight away. Henry VIII made famous in this picture by Holbein, and we think almost instinctively of an old man, serene and secure in his power, quite fat, if you look at some of the uh, rest of his body, um, with bloated stomach and legs because of his various illnesses, somebody uh, who was very powerful and had a big physical figure. That's the image I guess most of you would bring to mind if I asked you to think about Henry VIII. But then, viewers of a younger generation who remember a series called The Tudors might remember Jonathan Rhys Myers as a young Henry. This is quite a different sort of figure. A young man, lively and active, muscular, slightly troubled. 
because of course in the early years of Henry's reign, its position was a great deal more precarious than some of that iconography might suggest. This is probably truer to the young Henry uh, than the Holbein pictures we're so familiar with. We need to look at Henry a bit differently. And I think I want to argue that we need to look at the Reformation a bit differently. Whatever else it was, and whatever else we might learn from it, it was not, straightforwardly at least, a story of England breaking away and going it alone, leaving behind its European heritage and background. And just as we need to think about Henry differently, at least when we talk about the young Henry, so too that whole story which many of us learned at school of plucky England breaking away by itself at 1066 and all that is, at best, not quite the whole story. So let's start with where I think leave went wrong. Um, I was taught um, history at university by uh, a wonderful uh, medieval historian, and the great thing about him was that he knew that geography was as important as history. This was great if you found yourself in a tutorial and realised that you had no clue what you were going on about, because you could just say, oh, Dr. Maddicott, um, where is that on the map? And immediately he'd go and get a map from the cupboard, spread it out, and he'd waste the rest of the hour uh, looking at different things on the map. But the lesson it taught me was not only how to um, cover up your ignorance by distracting your tutor, it was also how important it is to look at the map. So let's start by looking at the map. This is a map of the Reformation. Uh, you can see in yellow the bits of Europe that remain, broadly speaking, Roman Catholic. The colours are different parts of Europe that became reformed, that broke away from Rome. And the first and most obvious thing that you can see is that it's not just England which has turned a different colour. So this is my first and most basic point. The Reformation was not just about plucky England breaking away from Europe. The Reformation was a Europe-wide movement. There were reformers in Switzerland, in Scotland, in the Low Countries, in Germany, in Scandinavia, and further east in Poland and Hungary. Of course, uh, Henry VIII wanted to break away with Rome because he felt that Henry VIII, not the Pope, should be in charge. That much is true. The English Reformation owes a great deal, deal to Henry's personal desire for more money, more power, and it must be said, more sex. But the only reason Henry could conceive of a reformation in the first place, the idea that you might break away from Rome and have your own kind of church, was because other people in Europe were thinking and doing the same thing. And one of the things we've been paying increasing attention to in recent years uh, in the scholarship is how closely connected the English Reformation was to the European Reformation. There were close links between individuals and ideas, between England and the continent. Many English clergy and scholars had spent time learning in Europe. Many European uh, scholars were tempted to come and teach in England. So the first point we need to understand, which I think the kind of caricature of the Redwood approach gets wrong, is that the Reformation was not just an English movement, it was a European one. It was about Europe as a whole changing, not just England leaving Europe behind. And indeed increasingly towards the end of the 16th and the beginning of the 17th century, the whole language of the Reformation became about England being part of this European movement. It's not just us, it's them as well. So my first point about what I think Eve got wrong, the Reformation is a European and not just an English movement. The second point I want to make is about place. One of the things that was entirely predictable is that the nations of the United Kingdom were likely to vote differently in the referendum because their experience of Europe is very different. It's interesting, isn't it? This realm of England is an empire. What about Scotland, Wales, or Northern Ireland? Now, if there are any Welsh people here, um, I do have to apologise that England really is shorthand for England and Wales, um, because by this time Wales was um, being integrated into the English system. 
I don't want to diss world cultural, the continuing importance of it, but legally by um, the later Tudor period, Wales was being administered as though it were another part of England. Scotland and Ireland were different. And it's not a coincidence that it is Scotland and Northern Ireland which voted to remain. The best way I can illustrate this is in one wonderful but slightly confused individual. Here's the Queen uh, at a Church of England service. She's meeting uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury. She's in St Paul's in this picture, a great neoclassical uh, building, vast, um, ornate with stained glass and soaring canopies. She's just heard a choir singing music, and she's talking to the leader of her English church, um, who is a bishop wearing a mitre. The Queen, though, is whatever else, a split personality, because when she goes on holiday to her Scottish resident, resident she becomes very different. This is a picture of the Queen in Crathy Church, which is on the Balmoral estate. Suddenly, she is a Presbyterian. She is in a church which has no bishops. She's in a church which is simpler in style and decoration. Uh, there are no choirs in these churches. Instead, she is probably singing a metrical psalm which has been designed deliberately to be sung by a congregation, not by a choir. So here is the Queen of England and the Queen of the Scots, the same person in one United Kingdom demonstrating that there were two very different experiences of the Reformation. In particular, the Scottish Reformation was much more continental than the English. One of the things we'll come to see is that the English Reformation was very idiosyncratic. The Scottish Reformation was much more mainstream. The English Reformation went through all sorts of different iterations which owed a great deal to the personal preferences of the king or queen and their advisers. Scotland, with its much greater links to France historically, owed a great deal more to the Reformation that came from John Calvin, uh, the connection with France and then with Switzerland. So they got rid of bishops, they got rid of choirs, they had a much, uh, what you might call, low set of doctrines on some key points. The English Reformation is a strange and peculiar hybrid. So the second point is that it's no good talking about this realm of England as a united kingdom with different component parts, with different histories, different cultures, and different relations to the continent. And you can see this in other ways uh, too. Scots law owes much more to the continental system of um, codes than English law, which is of course based on the common law and uh, the common sense or otherwise of the judges. The Scots education system is very different and has more affinity with the kind of baccalaureate model that you get on the continent than the English system of GCSEs and short, highly specialised three-year degrees. So place is different, and if we'd paid enough attention to what was really going on at the Reformation, we wouldn't have spouted nonsense about England breaking away, we would have seen that there was a whole United Kingdom with four countries with very different pasts. And that's before we even get on to the particular circumstances uh, much more tragic in Ireland. Um, I promise you I'll be as rude about the Remainers in a minute uh, as well. Um, the great slogans, when did we hashtag get the Reformation done? Well, at one level, um, it was pretty quickly. The business of passing the parliamentary legislation took about three or four years. Um, depends exactly on when you want to draw the lines, but about three or four years. Uh, it was a far um, easier business in some ways than the Brexit legislation. But did that mean that once the legal break with Rome had been uh, implemented, it was all over? Of course not. So when was the Reformation done? It was only in 1549 that the first English prayer book was produced, a key step uh, in having a reformed church, because one of the key marks of Reformation, of course, was that you should be able to pray and read the Bible in your own language. Uh, then, skipping over a lot of history, of course, we rejoined under Mary. So was it when we had the second Brexit, the second Reformation, with Elizabeth coming to the throne in the late 1550s? Well, no. Uh, was it 1649 when the Reformation came to a height 
uh, when we attempted to impose um, a new religion on the Scots, which led uh, to civil war after, it might be said, a lengthy and illegal prorogation of Parliament. <laughs> and there may be one or two parallels there. <laughs> Uh, was it 1649 when we chopped off the king's head? Well, no, um, because you then have to speed on to 1662. 1660, the monarchy is restored. 1662 is the new prayer book. And 1662 is the point at which uh, the British government by then abandons any notion of inclusiveness and decides to cast out those who have different views on the Reformation uh, from those deemed acceptable by the mainstream. So was that the end? Well, no. Um, because, of course, we then swung a little bit more Catholic under James II. And it's really 1688, long after uh, that, when it becomes settled, when the Act of Toleration is passed, and the acceptable range of uh, belief and practice is enacted. So whatever else my very superficial whistle-stop tour of the 16th and 17th centuries has told you, it should be that the idea you could get Reformation done for which we get Brexit done in a few years by passing legislation is simply for the birds. And anybody who says uh, that Brexit is now over because we have left is either being slightly disingenuous um, or slightly stupid. Another great um, hashtag um, is, of course, the Reformation means the Reformation. Uh, well, what does the Reformation actually mean? Um, what does Brexit actually mean? Under the great Queen Elizabeth, England opts for what might be called a soft reformation. It gets rid of um, the Pope and uh, all those nasty foreigners. Um, it gets rid of the worst excesses of uh, late medieval Catholicism. It gets rid of much of the calendar of saints. It gets rid of prayer for the departed. It brings in belief in justification by faith, which is the kind of um, 16th century equivalent of global free trade deals. Um, it uh, gets rid of a huge swathe, but it keeps cathedrals and candles in churches. It keeps robes for clergy and an order that has bishops at its head. You are allowed to kneel in England when you receive Holy Communion, which would have been anathema in some of the churches of the continent. The Scottish Reformation, of course, uh, was quite a different beast. They got rid of bishops, they got rid of choirs, they don't have cathedrals or choral even song. They got rid of almost all clerical vestments. So what does Brexit mean? What does the Reformation mean? It's a lot more complicated than simply mouthing a slogan. And if you take anything from this talk, it's that the slogans, anything you can put a hashtag in front of, is bound to be wrong. Now, just in case the 52% of you think I'm being biased, let me turn my fire on the 48% of you who are Remainers. And let's go back um, to looking at the map. This is a map of the British Isles and a bit of Europe in the 16th century. What you can see from this map, if you can look it up closely, is that when we talk about England, or Wales, or Scotland, or Ulster, now Northern Ireland, almost, in the 16th century, we're talking about something that was recognisably the same as it would have been in the 10th century, and is recognisably the same as it is now. Of course, there have been variations, but broadly speaking, England, Ireland, Scotland and Wales have been uh, concrete geographical and political entities for a very long time. Look down here. You've got France, which is not modern day France, and has only been a unitary state for a few hundred years by this time. You've got Westphalia, which is now split. Germany isn't even on this map because it doesn't exist, neither really does Italy. Flanders and Belgium are much bigger than their contemporary counterparts. So one of the things that Remain, I think, got wrong is that the British Isles genuinely were different. They had been, broadly speaking, very broadly speaking, stable geographical and political entities for a long time by the time of the Reformation, and they continue to be long afterwards. It is worth bearing in mind that it's not a cliche to say uh, that there has been no large-scale um, national uh, internal violence in the British Isles, Ireland accepted, um, since the Reformation. Large-scale, there has obviously been 
uh, from the two uh, problems. But there's been no large-scale internal civil war in uh, England since the 17th century. That's a very different story from the rest of Europe. And one of the things I think that Remain uh, didn't give enough attention to was that there was a genuinely, particularly English cultural identity which had been here for a lot longer than that we could speak of a German or an Italian or even a French cultural identity. It had been a lot less disturbed by events on the continent in terms of internal arrangements than any of those European countries. And one of the consequences of that, I think, is that um, England and Wales and Scotland to an extent have never felt they needed Europe in much the way that some of the continental countries have. So there was always a difference in the way the British Isles engaged with Europe because of that history and that map. And as I said uh, before, England in particular had been different in the course of its reformation. And one of the things uh, that was different is this. I'm not sure Remain quite understood the effects of having had a recognisably uh, consistent system of government for such a long time. This is a picture of one of Elizabeth's the first parliaments. If I show you one of Elizabeth II's parliaments and ask you to spot the difference, actually you'd be quite hard pressed. There is a monarch on the throne. There are lords, there are representatives of the church, the bishops. Here there are judges and there are the commons standing at the back. This picture in substance hasn't changed for 500 years, though of course there have been uh, a lot of changes um, in the relative position of the Crown and Parliament and the franchise and so on, but the institution is continuous over those 500 years and goes back even further. That is not true of many of the uh, institutions and systems of government on the continent. And I think one of the things in particular that the British tradition of parliamentary sovereignty gives you is um, the, the sort of, um, I'm trying to do this without swearing, um, uh, the kicking the blighters out argument. One of the things that the British system does allow the electorate to do is to kick out a government it no longer wishes to retain. That's what happened in 2010, in 1997, in 1979, in 1970, 1963, 1951, 1945. There isn't that tradition in the much more consensual uh, political models on the continent. And you can see it, can't you, the adversarial system in Britain swinging from one to the other rather than finding consensus. I don't think the Remain side of the argument realised the priority the uh, Westminster system attaches to being able to kick out people you no longer want. That's a very strong historic drive, and I think it drove much of people's dissatisfaction with a European institution that many considered uh, to be remote, unaccountable, and unkick outable. Um, we're over halfway, so don't worry. I think the EU um, got some things wrong as well. Let me tell you about a young man called, this is not him, uh, a young man called Thomas Winter. Uh, Thomas Winter was a young priest who had been educated at Oxford nothing wrong uh, with that. Uh, young Thomas was concerned about progressing in his career. He was quite ambitious. Nothing wrong with that. Um, he'd spent some time in Paris. Uh, well, you know, nothing wrong with that. Um, Thomas Winter, while still a schoolboy, was uh, the dean of uh, Wells Cathedral. Great job for someone who was still no, a student. At the same time, he was the Archdeacon of York. He had a job in Lincoln on the cathedral there and in Salisbury. So Thomas Winter, at this ridiculously young age, had jobs all over England, but that wasn't his worst offence. His worst offence was who his father was. His father was Cardinal Wolsey, who was supposedly a celibate Roman Catholic priest. Winter stands, unfortunately for him, as one of the whipping boys of the Reformation, because it was thought he pointed to a system which had become self-serving, corrupt, and distant from the lives of those whom it chose, whom it, whom it purported to serve. And I think 
uh, one of the things that the European Union didn't pay enough attention to was how it was perceived by people in localities far from the centres of power in Brussels, Strasbourg, or even London. So that's one thing I think the European Union got wrong. If it had looked at the Reformation, it would have seen what could be done by highlighting instances of apparent corruption or hypocrisy and identifying and exposing those uh, corruptions and hypocrisies, real or imagined, is something which, of course, our present Prime Minister, in his former career, made a bit of a name, of a name for himself doing. A more serious point, and here I will allow myself um, a personal view. One of the great sadnesses about the Reformation is that it did not need to happen. It was an entirely avoidable crisis. Here are two people, one Protestant, uh, one Catholic, Philip Melanchthon, uh, a moderate European reformer, um, uh, Ignatius of Loyola, the founder of the Jesuits, who remained a Catholic. Both of them argued in their writings and in their teachings that uh, the institution of medieval Catholicism had, at its worst, become corrupt and overbearing. It led, they both believed that the church needed reform that we needed to get back to a greater degree of simplicity, more emphasis on preaching the gospel and care for the poor, the kind of core purposes uh, for which the church was founded. The effort at reform from within failed. And I can't help wondering whether if the European Union had understood the need that all institutions have to be radical, in the sense of going back to their roots, trying to strive for greater simplicity, more connection with their origins and their sources and the people that they're trying to serve. That if it had been able to accommodate that kind of insight, it might have been able to change the way it operated in a way which met the concerns of many people, uh, both Remainers and Leavers, who might describe themselves as uncommitted uh, moderates. People who uh, were not dead set for or against, but did think uh, that perhaps the project had gone a bit too far, Perhaps it was a bit too distant and overbearing. And if, this is a great counterfactual, but my personal view is that if the European Union had been able to budge a few more inches uh, when Mr Cameron went to renegotiate, if it had been able to address some of the concerns that were being raised not just in the United Kingdom but across Europe, it might have been able to find a way of reforming from within, uh, which meant it didn't become a binary choice between remain and leave. And that's one of the great sadnesses as a Christian of the Reformation, that that uh, attempt to change the church from inside, to deal with some of the problems in the institution and the hierarchy, uh, failed, leaving people with a binary choice. Do we break away and become Protestant, or do we stay and become Catholic, remain Catholic? Last couple of minutes. Um, a few little things that I think we might learn uh, constructively. The Reformation was made possible in large part because of this, the printing press, which allowed people to circulate their own material uncontrolled by the authorities and distribute it widely. Um, everybody who thinks that this is a new thing hasn't learned their history properly. The printing press is the Twitter of the 16th century. Uh, and just as there is a good argument for saying that social media made Brexit possible, there's a very good argument for saying the printing press made the Reformation possible. But one of the things that we learned from the experience of this sort of prototype social media is that names really can hurt. Things can be said in the heat of conversation and battle which are very difficult to undo once said and have effects long after they've originally been uttered, even if they've been uttered carelessly or without real thought, especially so. Uh, we are still suffering from printing presses sending out images of the Pope as a devil. We are still suffering from people calling the Pope Antichrist. Within my lifetime, I'm not going to tell you how old I am, but um, within my lifetime, when a Pope came to Britain, it was a subject of real controversy. In the early 1980s, the Archbishop of Canterbury was heckled while preaching a sermon by people who thought the Pope was Antichrist and should not be invited to Britain. In a famous scene, uh, Archbishop Brunsey, as it then was, was told that the Pope was coming here to uh, corrupt us all and hilariously wanted to seduce the House of Windsor. 
So names can hurt. They have a long, long afterlife. And I think one of the things that we are going to suffer from for many years are phrases like enemies of the people, saboteur, betrayal, because those are harsh things and hard things and deep things to say. And we're still living with the wreckage of some of those things that were said at the Reformation 450 years, 500 years after the event. Penultimate slide. A break of a kind like the Reformation or Brexit, when you rip away a country from uh, centuries or decades of its relationships with its neighbors is costly and divisive. You may think it's necessary, if you're a lever, you may, if you're a remainer, weep about it. But neither side can argue that it is complicated and messy and divisive. As Mark um, said, I spent nine uh, very happy years of my life in beautiful Cambridge. The average wage in Cambridge is about £35,000. You can get to three international airports within about half an hour. You can get to London by road or rail to two London terminuses in less than an hour. Cambridge's success relies, among other things, on the free movement of people, academics being able to study and research anywhere in the world. It is not a coincidence that uh, Cambridge was between 70 and 80% Remain. But come with me on a journey I used to make uh, a couple of times a term. For curious reasons lost in the midst of time before the Reformation, at my college appointed governors to a school in Wisbeach. This is Wisbeach. It's only about 50 minutes drive away from Cambridge. Wisbeach has no mainline rail links since uh, Beeching. Although it's not very far from Cambridge, you can't get to London by road or rail in less than two hours. If, like me, you have children born in Cambridge, they'll be born in one of the world's biggest, largest and safest teaching hospitals. Have a baby in Wisbeach and you'll have to drive on rusty rural roads for about half an hour before you get to a maternity unit. Wisbeach has got no links uh, with the continent since the river silted up and became impassable, and it's had a high influx of low-skilled Eastern European immigration. It is not a coincidence that Wisbeach voted between 70 and 80% to leave. Cambridge and Wisbeach are an image, a metaphor, of what happens to a country when you don't pay attention to its divisions. It is entirely predictable that they should have voted the way that they did. And one of the real problems, and perhaps the biggest problem, is that just as Protestants and Catholics ceased to talk to each other because of the Reformation, Cambridge and Wisbeach have ceased to talk to each other. The reality is that we live in a hugely divided country, divided geographically between the four nations, divided by culture and identity, by experience of the modern global economy. We live in a country which is divided by social class, by your prospects, by where you went to school, whether or not you went to university, how old you are, and how you would describe yourself. And so the real message I want to leave you with is that you cannot live for very long in a country with a division like this, unless, as in the case of the Reformation, you resort to the ultimate sanction of the government, which is the threat of force. Uh, over dinner, um, uh, somebody very rightly said that the parallels between Brits and the Reformation are not complete, uh, because, of course, in the Reformation, there was widespread violence and bloodshed and martyrs on both sides. Um, the government now longer, thankfully, has the ability uh, to martyr large numbers of us because of our political views. But in the absence of coercion, the only way to heal these divides and build anything like a united country is if we all make an effort. So I'll leave you with this, and this is where the God bit comes in. This is Jesus meeting the Samaritan woman, a person with whom he had nothing in common, a person of dubious morality who'd had a large number of husbands and was now living in sin with someone who wasn't a husband, a woman in days when a man couldn't even talk to an un known woman. Uh, a woman of a different religion who was accused of worshipping uh, polytheistically pagan gods talking to a Jew who worshipped the one true God of Israel. It takes effort to heal and that's what I want to leave you with. It's taken over 400 years to even begin to heal the wounds of the Reformation. 
If we're going to heal the wounds and divisions of our present political disputes, it's going to require a similar kind of effort from all of us to talk to people whose experiences and views are different from us, to try and understand, however we voted, why a reasonable thinking person might have voted differently. It's going to need us all to get beyond the slogans and the politicking to try and understand the fears and aspirations of people in different parts of the country whose views and opinions are very different from our own. So I think the great theological lesson we learn from the Reformation and from the life of Jesus Christ, which we need to apply in our present climate, is that healing is essential and it requires effort and it will require a great effort from all of us if we are to move beyond this present dispute to the kind of united kingdom that I think we all look for and long for. You've been very patient. I have a very large glass of Spanish red wine to attend to. Thank you very much.